All right, well, I am so glad that I'm able to come and uh, talk to you this weekend. We are still in the series Food for Thought. And so it has been a lot of fun so far. Uh, we've had uh, some really interesting, but really um, awesome messages so far from Pastor Sean. I I've loved them all. And so today we're going to continue in that series. And today we're talking about a story that's really well known in the Bible, a story that Jesus told. And uh, there is something in this story. Now, there's something in every story Jesus told. When he told parables, they were always um, to be a picture or a representation of how the kingdom of God worked or what the heart of the Father was towards a person or on a certain matter. And so today we're going to look at that. And we're going to talk about, now it does tie in to food, so uh, just bear with me. But I want to talk about, first of all, real quick, just jump right into it, two important ideas that are so critical to anyone who wants to understand how to uh, be successful following Jesus and living in the kingdom of God, living the life of being a Christ follower. And these two ideas are identity and perspective. If you've ever heard me speak before, you know that this is like a big thing for me. And, and it usually kind of crops up at some point when I'm speaking, but I believe it's so important, identity and perspective. If you don't see yourself the way God sees you, that's identity. Or if you don't see others the way God sees others, that's perspective or situations the way God sees them, that's perspective, then you are in danger of being pulled under the influence of a wrong mindset, a wrong way of thinking that's based on your own limited understanding. We don't want that, right? <laughs> we don't want to uh, be influenced by the limitations that we have of being able to understand things, see things. That's why in Proverbs it's so important that it says that we trust the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. We don't want to do that. So we have to be very careful. And I personally am very careful with any and all I am statements that come out of my mouth uh, because I've got to make sure You've got to make sure that they line up with what God says about who you are. When you say, I am, and then something follows that, whatever that something is that follows I am needs to line up with what God says about who you are. Um, if it deviates at all, it's worthless and it's even dangerous. Uh, Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. There's some food for thought right there. <laughs> also be very careful with you are statements. So I am statements are those ones that come out of your mouth. You are statements are those ones that come into your ears. I'm very careful with you are statements. I have a filter set up that filters statements. When something or someone comes along and says, Aaron, you are this, you are that. Aaron, here's what you are. I may receive that, but it has to line up with what God says about who I am. If it doesn't line up with that, then I reject it. I will not have it. Uh, because um, I, if I buy into the lie of a wrong I am or you are statement, then I'm missing out on the love and the truth of God and his word for me. So the story we're going to look at uh, right here and right now is the story of a man who bought the lie of a wrong I am statement but was rescued and restored by the truth of a you are statement from the Father. Now this, hear me on this, this is a life-changing revelation. If you don't have a grasp on this, this has the potential to change your life. It really does. It's that big of a deal. If we can understand who we are, who God says we are, 
it will change our life. So let's look at this story. It's the story of the prodigal son, right? So Luke 15, 11 through 31. Let me just read through this real quickly and we'll dive into it. Uh, starting in verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. I think it's funny when you hear this story, a lot of times people will say, he got to such a bad place in his life, he had to eat the, the food the pigs ate. Well, this says that he wanted to eat the food the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. He had nothing. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy <clears throat> to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son, this son of yours who devoured your property with prostitutes came, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. So, you know, the story, the son, the prodigal son in the beginning of the story, he grows up in his father's house, but. He doesn't appreciate what he has. And he goes to his father and he says, I want my inheritance now. He goes out and he just wastes it on a horrible living and sinful living and all this stuff. And he ends up down and out and defeated and discouraged. And he realizes that even the servants in his father's house are living better than him. At least they get food. And so he decides he's going to go back and live as a servant at his, as his father's house. But his father reacts in a totally uh, surprising way to him. So in this story, there is uh, this thing that happens at the end. And, and it's, it's really the... Um, the, just the awesome part of the story, the, the, how the father responds to the son returning. And one of the things that the father does is he kills the fattened calf. And he, he basically has this calf prepared. And the fattened calf represents a celebration. Because this calf was saved for a very special celebration. And when the father sees his son returning home, he decides this is the day. This is the moment. Bring the fattened calf. We are going to have an epic celebration. And so we're talking about this today. The heart of the father towards those who return and he kills the fattened calf. So beef, it's what's for dinner. Okay, so we're going to make ground beef wellington. So follow along. 
So here's what, we've got our ingredients here. And um, the first thing you have to do, you gotta heat your oven to 400 degrees. We got that going. And then you mix six ingredients together. Our six ingredients that we have to put together are two eggs beaten. We got our, no, no, that's not eggs. Where's our eggs? We're already, it's already falling apart. We've got two eggs that have to go in. We've got a pound and a half of ground beef. That that's our bread. eggs. That was the breadcrumbs. Those are breadcrumbs. So I'm putting this in? Yeah, put your eggs in. And then a pound and a half of ground beef. Okay, and then it's calling for the breadcrumbs. We've got our breadcrumbs right here. They're going in. Um, it's calling for uh, two tablespoons of dried parsley. Is this parsley? Yes, but that needs just, to be cut. Just yeah. chop it up a little bit and throw some in there. It doesn't matter. Just chop it, up. it doesn't have to be I'll perfect, right? You said two tablespoons? Yeah, it's one and um, two tablespoons of dried parsley. Okay, that looks about right. There you go. Okay, one teaspoon. I think what they do is they pinch. They put in a pinch of salt, right? So that's about a pinch right there. Here's our cream over here. We love cream here. Yeah. Go through a lot of cream. Tablespoon. I'm just gonna eye it. Yeah, one. eyeball. And that looks good. That's about right. I do that a lot. So now you're gonna you're gonna get a, a spoon or something to mix it with. So this is like. I mean, you could just use your hand. You could. Should I, we do that? Yes, I think you should. You think I should? Yes. Okay. Well, you know, let me tell you this. When you're working in the kitchen, you want to be sure. You want to be sure that everything is sanitary. Okay. So this is our towel that we wash our hands with, and we're going to throw that over there. Okay. So now beef wellington. Oh, that is a texture that you really can't experience in any other way. The combination of raw ground meat nice. with eggs and breadcrumbs um, creates an experience, a tactile experience that is uh, unusual. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna chop the onion, Sarah's gonna chop the mushrooms. Okay, so, You know, there's a uh, there's a certain technique that chefs use, and professional professionals of the culinary arts um, when chopping an onion. There's a right way to do it, and whatever that is, I have no idea what it is. So I just start cutting it up until it goes from a large piece of onion to many smaller pieces of onion. And um, I don't think I have the uh, bravery or self-assurance. Here's an onion piece, it's just gonna go over there. I don't think I have the bravery or self-assurance to do that super fast lightning chop thing. I think you should try. But I, I need my fingers to play guitar. And so I kind of want I fun. to keep those fingers in place. The next thing is we need to get a skillet with okay. the butter and saute the onions and the mushrooms. Okay, so we're going to uh, <clears throat> we're going to use a cast iron skillet. And I'm going to do a quick edit right here. And we're going to go over here to the stovetop. Sarah is now working on our um, sauteing action that's going on. So she's melting the butter in a cast iron skillet. Um, she's putting in the onion and she's putting in the mushroom. And so what we're going to do And this is... part, I don't think you explain. This part of the beef wellington is the mushroom layer. There's so... a mushroom layer. Yeah. So if you love mushrooms, you have a special layer just for you. Um, if you don't... It's a really big layer. If you don't love mushrooms, there's a rather unpleasant layer <laughs> in beef wellington. That you need to be aware of. Okay, uh, while our mushroom mixture is reducing and getting ready, 
um, I'm going to pull out our puff pastry. We use We Waka puff pastry. I'll get it under the overhead camera here. We Waka puff pastry, European bakery style dough. It's actually the only puff pastry I can find. Okay, so I'm gonna just lay this out right here. Pull this sheet off. There we go, right? No. There we go. All you pastry chefs out there, you can just kind of hold your breath for a little bit and not cringe. Okay, cut each sheet into four squares. So, I can do that. I know how to take a rectangle and make four little rectangles. All right, so now we got our four squares, and we are going to spread the mushroom mixture across each square and top with a thin layer of cheese. Now, we've chosen to go with a shredded Gouda cheese, and um, I hope it's, oh, I can't resist, Don't I'm sorry. Do Don't do I it. hope it's good. Uh, can't help it. Maybe it's because I'm a dad. Is that a dad joke? Okay. okay, so. This looks really good, by the way. We're spreading the mushroom mixture. It smells good. It's really good. It smells good. Amazing. Yeah. Mushrooms, garlic, onions, sauteed. I don't know how this could be bad. I've never had it before. Mushrooms, garlic, onions, beef. I, I mean, it's basically like. It's basically like an upper scale hot pocket. Am I right? <laughs> I mean, isn't that kind of what it is? So we're going to do a thin layer of mozzarella. And I like cheese. So we found some kind of a meal here that has like the stuff we both like. This is kind of like our special recipe. Okay, and then put a half cup of meat mixture formed into flattened balls on top. Okay, so we're back into our beef goop here. All right, now I'm gonna let you do this part. It says, pull the corners over the meat and pinch the edges together. Don't worry if this is tricky. It is for everyone, it isn't just you. Oh, it's not just me. Why do you have a knee to it? Okay, the corners. Over. I think I can do this. This is going to be really good. And I think this is going to work for this. Wow. Do that. You move these over to the cookie sheet. Do you have that sprayed? Yes, it is greased. It's a roast beef and mushroom hot pocket. It's not roast beef, it's ground beef. Okay, we are almost there. We have uh, assembled our beef wellingtons, which again are kind of like a fancy hot pocket. Um, I have cut slits in the top, and now we're doing our egg wash. I, I want to see everybody's beef wellington on yeah, social media this I week. Someone make uh, Sean's. Yeah, make somebody it? made Pastor Is Sean's um, jalapeno yeah. cheese bread. It looked really good. So somebody make a beef Wellington. I want to see somebody else try this and see what happens. It wasn't that hard. Huh? It wasn't that hard. I thought it. I kind of picked this because I thought it would be challenging and I would really mess it up and make it horrible. Of course, you kind of helped me not mess it up. I guess. Yeah. Okay, so that's done. Thumbs on cookie sheets. Bake 30 to 40 minutes on 400 degrees. So now we're going to put this in our preheated oven for 30 to 40 minutes and we'll be right back. All right, here it is. Beef Wellington, ground beef Wellington. I think it turned out pretty good. It looks awesome. So while it was in the oven cooking, Sarah made a... Uh, Mushroom, onion, garlic, Reduction, Reduction gravy. sauce, what kind of fancy word? Yum. 
basically a really great sauce that goes on this and we're going to uh, try this out and it's going to be awesome. All right, so let's see what we have done. It's flaky. Okay. Good. I like it. I love it. It's a winner. Mm -hmm. Winner, winner, beef dinner. <laughs> it was pretty good. It really was. I think we'll have it again. Uh, I'm glad we chose that. But we had to choose something beef because we're talking about the fattened calf. We're talking about the father's over the top response. Uh, when his son came home. You saw, back when we were reading the story, you saw the way the father responded. He says he saw him come from a long way off. He felt compassion. He ran. He embraced him. He kissed him. So why is it so hard to believe that the father would have this kind of a response when one of his children comes home? Why is it so hard for us to understand and believe that the father would have an overjoyed response when one of his kids decides to repent and come home. Uh, Pastor Sean t spoke last week and he was talking about repentance and how repentance is really so much of it is a change in our thinking. And by the grace of God, we come to these points where we realize that we've been thinking the wrong way, where, where we realize that our thoughts and our mindsets have not been godly, right? They've not been kingdom minded. They've not been maybe walking in love. Maybe they've been uh, just lost in doubt and unbelief or something like that. And we get to this point where we, we see that and we come to terms with it. But then... Why is it that when so many people come to grips with wrong thinking, speaking, or acting, they fall under condemnation instead of grace? Why does that happen? Because it does, doesn't it? I mean, it's happened for me. It's happened for basically everybody I've ever known that that has happened. Where when God wants us to receive grace... Instead, we receive condemnation. But it's not from him, right? Because the Bible says there's therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ. None. And yet we choose condemnation, right? But God wants us to receive grace uh, so we can be who he sees when he looks at us. Because that's what grace is. It's grace is Becoming the person that God sees when he looks at you. When we fall into condemnation, we believe a lie about our identity. And it's a lie that's based on our works and our righteousness. And our righteousness is not based on our works. Thank God, right? Our righteousness has nothing to do with our works. We cannot build up and accumulate righteousness by our works, right? In reality, our identity rests solely on Jesus and on his works. I love this verse. It's one of my favorite in the whole Bible. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him who knew no sin... Uh, to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What an amazing thing. When God the Father looks at you, he sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus. Now there may be a part of you that says, well, that's not fair. That's not right. I didn't earn that righteousness. But that's grace, isn't it? We can become the person that God sees when he looks at us. We can become like Jesus. So there's a critical moment in this story of the prodigal son. There's this crucial moment where we see these two ideas uh, basically in combat with each other. Verse 18, the, um, the, the son says, I will arise and go to my father. 
So he's making a good uh, decision right there, right? He's making a good choice. He understands, I have blown it. I've made bad decisions. I'm going to get up from this situation and I'm going to go back to my father. Awesome choice. Good job. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Okay, great. Sounds like he's apologetic. He's repentant. He's, he's, he's seeing the error, right? He's seeing the problem that he's gotten himself into. He's aware of it. Okay, verse 19. I am. Okay, here comes an I am statement. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hand, or your hired servants. And then again, we see him make that statement again when he actually goes to his father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I want you to see what's happening right here. He has tied his performance, his works, his actions to his identity. He's connected them. Okay? This is what I've done. Because of what I've done, this is who I am. Right? Now, in this case, he's saying this is who I'm not. But he's making a connection between I have sinned against heaven and you and I am no longer worthy. Now, what happens next is um, incredible. It's awesome. And I love it. The father does not even acknowledge it. He doesn't correct it. He doesn't say, oh, no, no, son, don't say that. Don't say bad things about yourself. No, no, you're better than that. No, don't feel that way. He just ignores it. He doesn't even acknowledge that the son makes that false I am statement. God chooses to not participate in our doubt and unbelief. We may have doubt and unbelief. We may struggle with that at times. It's important to understand that God chooses to not participate in that. He just decides to not be a part of that. Instead, what God does is he pulls us into his love and into his kingdom thinking. So the father turns to his servant and says, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. So what's happening right here is the father is making a statement of his own. Remember, in the very beginning, we talked about I am statements and you are statements. The prodigal son made an I am statement. Because I've sinned, I am no longer worthy. The father is making a you are statement. But we have to dig into this just a little bit to see what it is. <clears throat> so he says, uh, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring shoes. So let's unpack this real quickly. He said, put the best robe on him. The robe is the symbol of a son's position. The robe is a symbol of the son's position. Now remember, what is this? What are we looking at here? This is a parable Jesus is teaching. This is a parable. And remember, parables were taught by Jesus to reveal the kingdom of God and or the heart of God. That's why Jesus taught parables. And so what we're seeing here is a revelation of the kingdom of God and the heart of God. So he puts a robe on his son because the, the robe is a symbol of a son's position. Because the son said, I've sinned and therefore I'm no longer worthy. From the son's perspective, the I am statement that he's making he has severed his position. He's lost his place. He's lost his position. The father is responding to that and saying, bring the robe, put it on his shoulders. I'm restoring his place. He also said, put a ring on his hand. So powerful, so important. The ring is a symbol of a son's authority. The ring is a symbol of a son's authority. With this ring, the son can act on behalf of his father. He can speak on behalf of his father or the household. It gives uh, the son the authority of the family. So when he's wearing this ring, it's like a signet ring, right? He can seal 
documents. It's official. God gives us authority to speak on his behalf. Is that insane? Is that crazy? It seems crazy, but it's true. And if you remember, this is not just a story. This is revealing the kingdom of God and the heart of God. I want you to start right now as we move on to the last part of this. I want you to start applying this right here to you. Okay. God is restoring authority. You may feel like you've lost it. You may feel like you've dropped the ball, like you've gone too far. You've done too much. You can never go back. God is restoring authority. That's what the symbol of the ring is. He said, put shoes on his feet. Shoes were a symbol of a son's privilege. Now, in this day, in this age, in that day, in that age, in that context and in that setting, servants did not wear shoes. But sons and daughters of the house wore shoes. And of course, the son returned to his father uh, in, in rags and barefoot. And one of the first things the father says is put shoes on his feet. And he restores the privilege, the abundance, and the blessing of the father's house to the son. So when the son says, I am not worthy, how many times have you made that statement about yourself? Now, maybe you didn't use those exact words, right? Maybe you said, I can't seem to get it together, you know, uh, I just seem to always fail in this area. It's just, I'm just a failure there. I guess, I guess that's just who I am. I'm just, I'm just an old dog who can't learn a new trick. And and that's just who I am. That's just my weakness. That's, that's where I'm going to always be that way. But that's not a correct I am statement. And so the father ignores all of that. He won't participate in that kind of a statement. But he says, I restore your place, I restore your authority, and I restore your privilege. Again, Jesus is teaching how the kingdom works, and he's revealing the heart of the Father. So what about that fattened calf, right? I mean, we've spent most of this time talking about words that were spoken, right? The the son made an I am statement. The father made a you are statement and they spoke these words. And the words are so important because the father's words reveal the father's intent to restore place, to restore authority, to restore privilege. But the fattened calf reveals the father's heart. It does. Because, again, remember, the fattened calf is a very special Uh, um, represents a very special occasion or event. Um, It didn't say bring a fattened calf. It didn't imply that there were many fattened calves that you could go choose from. Just any time they wanted to, they could do this thing. No, it said the, bring the fattened calf. It implies that there was just one. So it's kind of like saying we have the resources to have one epic party. And I am choosing to use those resources up right now. That's how excited I am. That's how overjoyed I am to see my son or my daughter coming back to me. That's the heart of the father towards you returning to him. And the reason I'm pointing that out and the reason I'm focusing in on that is so that you will not believe the lie that God is angry at you, hates you, despise, is, is so uh, preoccupied with your failure that he doesn't love you. Those things are lies. God loves you. God cares for you. God is more than excited. His response to any of his sons or daughters coming home is overwhelming joy. So the calf was being saved for a special occasion, for a special purpose, and it was prepared as a feast and a party, and that's the way God feels about you. So if you are like the prodigal son, and you have wandered away, you have decided, "Uh, I'm going to try this over here. I'm going to disengage from all of this stuff about Jesus and church and the Bible. And I'm just going to go do my own thing. But you've realized 
No, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. God is not mad at you. God is not wanting to pour out wrath on you. God is not wanting to punish you. God loves you, and he is eagerly watching for you to return. Just like that father that saw his son far off and got up and ran to him. That's the heart of the father towards you. So I want you to know the intent of the father, which is to restore your place, to restore your authority, and to restore your privilege. And I want you to know the heart of your father that is leaping for joy at your return. So I'm praying that you'll understand this. I'm praying that, uh, that you'll see this. But it's just as likely that if this is something that's hitting home for you today, that it's not that you're the prodigal, but you're the older brother or sister, right? It's just as likely because maybe you have been in the Father's house serving faithfully, but you've never really experienced his love, his goodness, his abundance. And it's not that they haven't been there available to you. Remember, the last line of this story is the father saying to the older brother, Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. So for many people, the older brother is the principal character of this story because that's their story. So I want to lead us in a prayer of repentance and restoration. So whether you're the prodigal or whether you're the older brother, let's pray together right now. Let's invite the Holy Spirit right here to bring repentance and restoration together. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Father, thank you for your unending love that can't be changed. It can't be lessened. It can't be lost. Thank you for a love that we don't even understand. Thank you that you welcome the prodigal, you welcome the runaway with open arms. Father, for those who have wandered off, I pray right now that you would draw them back to you, to your house right now by the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would put a robe around their shoulders, put a ring on their finger, put shoes on their feet. Thank you that you redeem and you restore. And Lord, for those who are like the older brother who have stayed in your house faithfully, but they've never understood that you want to share your goodness with them. They've never experienced your love in a way that has uh, just changed them and moved them. Lord, I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation to come on them right now and that you would open their eyes to the truth of your goodness. Let them walk in the fullness of everything you have for them. In Jesus name. Amen.